talk about media and the role of media in a Mongolian society. I have very distinguished panelists here. And uh, the best way, I think, uh, I will ask everybody, from my say, okay. uh, very shortly, introduce yourself, your job, and your stand on media. But first of all, tell your name and what you do. Please, go ahead. My name is Deborah Mon, and I'm. Uh, sorry, my name is Deborah Mon, and I'm a presenter and correspondent for Thomson Reuters, Reuters Insider. Um, I work in Hong Kong, and we have had. I uh, worked actually for a local station in Hong Kong during the handover, so I have a share of experience with self censorship, and um, I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Hello, my name is Naming Chirpat. I'm working in Mongol TV, a representative of the independent commercial TV stations in the country. Um, I'm also really looking forward to this session. Hello, my name is Margo Dracos. I'm from Los Angeles. I am um, a partner in an investment group in the technology space, but I'm a cellist who has turned recently in the last few years to technology, and I've spent uh, the last bulk of uh, time uh, co-founding a company that has been um, a digital distribution channel for mobile applications and websites and worked very closely uh, with Google Creative Labs and YouTube um, specific uh, aligned with some of the, the conversations I think we'll explore today. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ellen Glenda. I'm with Hilton Worldwide and I run the company's corporate communications. And I would say over the course of my somewhat limited career, I cannot believe the kind of dynamism that we've seen in the media, the level of fragmentation, the transition from straight reporting to much more editorializing, and a lot of blurring of the lines. So I'm really curious to hear from the people in the audience, um, as well as the, the, the other people in the panel, um, about which direction they think media is going. My name is Talon. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I work at the Shutout uh, which is the, one of the top uh, web news websites here in Mongolia. Um, I'm very looking forward to this event and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Hi, my name is Chris Gary, and I am the uh, China market leader for Burson Marsteller, a large global public relations company. And we work for uh, governments and companies and NGOs, and basically our advice to all of them is they need to become media companies themselves. So maybe the definition of media is actually expanding. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Oyanga, and I work in the an internet marketing specialist at the New Media Marketing Agency. The company's name speaks for itself. We are a digital uh, marketing social community engagement and um, creative development firm, and I'm very happy to be here. Hi, I'm Anja. Uh, I'm a director of Mongolian Public Television, and uh, I'm looking for a session. Well, thank you. As you see, we have a quite colorful, different representation of a public, private, and corporate sector in the, uh, all around the world. And uh, with me, well, maybe some of you may not know, I write a weekly announce column every week in the National Newspaper, which is translated in English, into English and posted in a new post, another English newspaper, and I run also a weekly interview TV talk show and on TV, on, on TV and TV. Um, well, let's start it this way. Uh, I would ask, uh, or who presented uh, last week, are you that to a little bit brief about the media transformation we had uh, observed recently from having the most strong state of official media now into public media. Please brief us about that and uh, what kind of problems you may face. Because today we'll go for exactly to the point. Okay? Thank you. Please have a day. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, briefly, uh, Mongolia um, had only uh, one big uh, TV in radio until 1996. 
It was uh, uh, state-controlled and uh, street-owned uh, television, central radio and television, uh, basically was a propaganda tool for the communist or socialist party. Um, so it has been that way, um, even though we we were experienced the democratic revolution in uh, 1990, and then um, uh, Democrats won an election in 1996, and then um, uh, the ruling party started to think about privatize uh, or change the ownership of the media. So. Um, even though uh, the democratic movement, uh, when they started, they talked about the media freedom and uh, speech freedom and uh, the transferring of the media, uh, the thing is the ruling uh, parties never uh, did an action uh, when they get the power, even the Democrats, uh, after they won the election in 1996. So the central, um, central um, state-owned um, radio and um, television finally uh, transferred its um, ownership from state to public uh, in 2005, only six years ago. Um, so and in, in during that period, 15 years of period, what happened in the media field in Mongolia was uh, a lot of uh, uh, private channels grow. Uh, it started from small production studios, uh, which produced mon uh, mainly a political PR campaign, um, commercial videos and stuff. And then <clears throat> eventually, because the ruling party controls this nationwide uh, central radio and television, the minority didn't have voice. So um, the private media's uh, the first seed or first interest was basically political reason to have their own voice. So um, that puts the, um, the, the goal of the media in a politically oriented situation. So it has been that way in 21 years in Mongolia, and it still hasn't changed. And uh, the evidence on, I'm saying that is, um, is the 2012 election is coming. Um, we just seen two another TV stations <coughs> opening now. One is coming, and another is already opened. So that um, proved that the um, political interest uh, is still in the media. So, uh, on the newspaper side, um, there was a, uh, it's a little different. On the press side, uh, in 1998, um, the media law, there, there was a law on media freedom. Uh, it's just kind of a statement law. It has only five issues, basically saying, um, stating the state can't own the media. So that put the media press uh, to privatize, uh, but the distribution side is still in the government's control. Uh, so basically, um, press is mainly um, centralized in the uh, centralized in the, um, in the city, couldn't distribute it to the nationwide. So um, a public, the public uh, basically started to switch their source of information to TV because, because of this distribution system, no one, uh, especially in the countryside, couldn't get the newspapers on time. So they switched the um, information source to TV, which is which are mostly, um, I, as I said before, politically oriented uh, media source. So that's the basic situation in Mongolia. So.
Okay, thank you. Uh, we have about 900 media in the country. We have uh, 30 TV stations, 14 of them terrestrial, 16 cables TV. And I think per capita, Mongolia has a number one position in the world by amount of media. This one unique situation that is it good or what we will discuss it. And I would like to ask our uh, another uh, I guess Mamin, who is recently uh, running this one of the US uh, TV channel, Mongol, Mongol TV. So please tell us uh, how is it like working as a private TV? Is it uh, what kind of competition you would face and what kind of things you think really we have to solve? Just like uh, Mr. General Savan said, we've got 30 TV channels in the entire country compared to five channels in uh, major channels in the, the UK. So it is a stiff competition, definitely, and it's motivated gen mainly by politics. General motivation behind the TV stations are by politicians. So uh, as an independent company running without any political background, it would be very difficult to compete against. And uh, it's, on the other hand, it's very difficult from a point of view, from a financing point of view. Um, most of the TV stations have difficult time financing it. As you know, that the media industry is financed by um, advertisement and promotions. So if you divide 2.8 2 million people by 30, big uh, networks and that is competing against businesses would be extremely difficult to get the business. So uh, motivation of getting a revenue and motivation of getting a financial background is changing from a promotional point of view towards political so there could be a different kind of uh, contracts and things happen behind the scene in order to finance themselves in the industry. Your yeah, that's a very good start. Uh, before we going into the debate, inviting our foreign guests, I would like to ask a uh, question well, about the show demand, which in Mongolian word, in Mongolian language means direct demand. And this is one of the young and good, very well visited websites. Please tell us about the website and how do you feel this freedom of media in this country? Do you feel it or not? Thank you. Uh, show that event was established two years ago. Um, it's a um, news website, daily news app, uh, website. Uh, it's the second uh, most visited news website here in Mongolia. So the source of the information is very uh, important to the people. The reality of the information should be very uh, true and honest, appreciated by uh, honest uh, things. But here in Mongolia, the current situation, I think, is that almost like, as Mr. Jelasan said, as Ms. Nimi said, over 30 TVs, over 30 daily newspapers, over 30 news websites, over here in Mongolia, almost, uh, as said, 800 of them, uh, there's a stiff competition. So I think that here in Mongolia, most websites or most this media sector businesses is related uh, to either politics or either business. The background is both, uh, either one of them. Um, as Ms. Nomi said, um, uh, it is financially very difficult to strive here in Mongolia in this business. You have to just be one side or be in the, um, what do you say, A or B. There's two options only. You have to choose either, either of them. Uh, so I think the current situation is kind of difficult here for the independent um, media sector to uh, like evolve. But I think that Mongolian journals can exercise their professional rights here in Mongolia because of the very uh, strict pressure from the businesses or the political opponents. It's either uh, you support them or you support the, uh, the rest. Uh, you. Uh, you said either politicians or businesses, yes. It's yeah, one of it's the very most, uh, most confusing issue in the country because we don't have a difference. We don't know the difference of politicians or businesses. So, 
Okay, uh, how about uh, Moyen Gratis? Uh, you have a new media agency, it's new tools. Uh, what kind of difficulties do you have in your place and uh, these interviews? Yes, um, good question. <laughs> well, uh, I think compared to traditional media, um, uh, when you refer to new media, we mean um, social media, social networks, websites, blogs, all of this combined is, can be referred to as new media. And uh, compared to traditional media such as television and radio, we, I believe we have far, uh, far more or less um, difficulties. Um, let's take examples, take an example from um, statistics, uh, statistics that we have in Mongolia. Uh, they are about, they have currently about um, 750,000 people uh, with internet. Out of that uh, amount, more than half of the population, more, more than half of the 750,000 people uh, are active on the internet. And out of that active people, about we have about 200 people, 200,000 people, Mongolia people on Facebook, and roughly about 50,000 on Twitter. So it's from these statistics, you can see that. Uh, um, the amount of people that are using online media, social media is increasing day by year, month by month, and uh, year by year. So these statistics, for example, um, the number of uh, internet users within uh, one year, from 2009 to 2010, increased by 40%. So this is very um, interesting statistic. And, um, well, uh, our, our company, we basically, um, we uh, work on work in an online environment. So um, from what we see, um, not only um, the younger generation, the youth, but also um, like businessmen, um, companies, politicians, uh, any, every, everyone in all different kinds of fields are uh, becoming, are having an online presence. They're using Twitter, they're using Facebook. Um, earlier on uh, in the discussion with um, University students with the YGLs, I heard someone say uh, the, uh, the president of Mongolia, the president of Mongolia, Mr. Ilpukdor, is my Facebook friend. And so it's um, people are becoming, no matter their uh, rank in society, they're becoming more and more engaged um, in reaching out to people, reaching out to the public, uh, disregarding their age, sex, status, um, their race. Um, they want to become more and more closer to the people. They want to hear what they're saying. They want to, um, and this is, this is actually a very uh, good news, a positive aspect of the internet. So it, the internet basically cuts out the borders between um, maybe uh, someone, it can be someone from parliament from a certain business say, or uh, uh, it basically raises the borders between that and the community. So it can sort of um, engages both parts into one whole. So that's actually a very positive aspect of the Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, fantastic news. Can you imagine? Ten percent of Mongolians are on Facebook. How about that? Seventy-five percent have uh, cellular phone, including all people around the country. You would see the herdsman sitting on his horse and transfer one of his tools, his daughter is all about the city. How about transaction costs? So we live in such a period, and we have with it also a lot of difficulty. Mongolia is one of few countries who is doing economic and political transition at the same time. So there is difficulties, ups and downs. So that's what our Mongolian partners, panelists, have introduced to partially. Uh, I would like to ask um, our on my right hand, Margo. You have been a uh, part of this uh, wonderful project that Google made, having all musicians all around the world get together and you have selected. Please tell us about that project and how do you see this sort of things can be done in a society like Mongolia in this transition period with whatever we have? Well, thank you. Um, just at sort of the 30,000 foot level, I think that that's uh, something that I think about or that I work on a great deal at the moment is sort of the intersection between culture merging the sort of deep traditions of the past and what is occurring in a society with the present um, and, and sharing, being witnesses of the present and inspiring new innovations. So if you think about it, in a sense, technology is enabling culture to be shared 
in ways in ways that has not previously been, been possible, and it's inspiring new innovation, and it's it's we're really seeing such a redefinition and a redistribution of what community means. And I think that you know technology is causing certainly in the West we're seeing it immensely, and and I I, I don't know in Mongolia, but I assume probably the same challenges are moving forward where you have. Uh, a lot of the existing models for, for supporting the media are have just been blown blown apart because of the fact that now you can everyone wants what they want when they want it. They don't have it doesn't have the same shelf life that it used to in the past. And so this this has created a, a great deal of disruptive change. But at the same time I think technology is part of is is offering enormous new opportunities and democratization of access and and uh, and it's a very exciting time. Um, amidst the challenges. Uh, I worked the last year and a half doing the digital strategy in my, a company that I founded did the mobile uh, mobile distribution apps for this project for, called the YouTube Symphony. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's a fabulous example of kind of what you can do to, to have a, an event and when people want to be become active participants. People, if you think about the 20th century model of media and things, you know, oftentimes you came into, you know, watch a movie or you came to a show or you, uh, a press conference and it was kind of a one-way street. You come, you receive, and you leave. And I think, you know, now we're seeing this complete transformation of where people want to connect with an event, whatever that is. They want to be able to share their own experiences from that with their own community. They want to be recognized for their, their expression with their friends. They want to be validated from that. And they want to uh, be able to re-engage um, and reconnect with that experience again. And so in the Google case, what we did was a 101, uh, well, a series of people uploaded their own audition material to YouTube. There was a voting period globally. Um, and 101 musicians were selected and flown to the Sydney Opera House, uh, to Sydney, Australia, and to perform together. So it's 101 musicians from 33 countries. And what we decided to do was actually turn the live event inside out, literally. So we, the, the live event was, was uh, streamed on uh, about 52 different websites um, in mobile applications. It was projected on the sales of the Sydney Opera House with interactive uh, artwork, um, and and so and it was staggering. There were 33 million people who watched online, and 2.8 million of them watched on their mobile phones for an average of 25 minutes. And uh, it was the number one tweeting uh, trending hashtag on Twitter for about nine hours, and uh, it was just it was a mind-boggling uh, experience and uh, to give a frame of reference the the, the band U2 uh, had uh, 10 million viewers about a year and a half ago online so when you think about the opportunities for, for how does that relate to Mongolia um, I think that that there's immense uh, the, the barrier to entry to distribute content it doesn't have to be done on a you know, at a Google budget, but you have, there's so many things you can use these technologies that are, are affordable to reach and distribute uh, content in a very meaningful way. And, and what are the uh, when, uh, when we, Michael herself is a musician, so it was a part of a big project, and I want, I think, the audience will have more questions on that part, about that, the YouTube part. Uh, before going uh, to the next uh, speaker, I, I just, uh, who is uh, Ellen? Uh, Ellen is a uh, vice president for Hilton Worldwide. Is Hilton in Mongolia now? No. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems that people here might know more about the Hilton coming to Mongolia than I do, but um, you know, in all seriousness, there, there was a deal done um, some time ago and I think that there is a very strong possibility that that deal will come to life. So um, often these things take a long time, and as you know, as, as people know, until until it's open, it's not open. But, um, but I think there's a very strong possibility, if not probability, that deal will be here in, in not without too much time. You've been a global corporate communication vice president. What is your take uh, for a country like Mongolia with this sort of media? What could be the media? I mean, I think it's an absolutely crucial role, and I think that um, 
given the number of people who are engaging here, I think there is a real opportunity for the media to play a role in asking questions to the government and to businesses. I think that um, you know, coming from the corporate side, it sounds like a really ideal situation where I might just issue news and it just gets played back to the media the way I'd like to see it. Um, unfortunately, that's not very realistic, um, but I understand that um, it's a real shift in mindset to move from a point in time where as a reporter you take the news that you're given and you essentially print it to really starting to have the courage to ask the questions and to agitate between the groups that are putting out the news or to find people who might have a different point of view and represent it fairly. So I think it's a really incredible opportunity because um, there are a lot of learnings from places that have um, have progressed with the press but maybe not necessarily in the best or most effective way. Uh, there you have a question for you. You, have been, uh, you. you are working for sustainability the way you have been a part of the whole campaign, right? Please tell us about sustainability with our current everyday mining, say, rush in the country. What's about the sustainability, sustainability importance sure. in, 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 at this particular time? Sure. Well, based on my very, very limited knowledge of, of Mongolia, mm -hmm. It, it seems like the sustainability challenge uh, is one where there's a lot of focus right now on what the government is going to do and what companies, foreign companies, are going to do. And that attention is warranted and should stay focused. However, I think that what individuals do is going to be hugely important to Mongolia's future and, and, and its sustainability. And I was actually at a press conference today um, where they were hand, where they were promoting the uh, the, the, the more uh, the much more uh, efficient and environmentally friendly home stoves and, and you know social marketing and telling people in the curves to, to switch out the stoves and they're heavily subsidized and this kind of social marketing I mean again the sustainability debate has focused on what institutions are going to do but the real scale on having an impact, positive or negative, around sustainability issues is what individuals choose to do. Personal level, if I choose to, you know, in the West, purchase a car or use partial car ownership. And in Ulan Bator, if I keep the old stove because I'm comfortable with it, because I've heard that the, the hole is bigger for a pot than the new stove, things like that. And this is there, then we touch the issue of uh, how much people can afford those sort of uh, Call or whatever they right. were, and uh, we happen to meet people. You know, half of the population in the city lives outside of this uh, city. And they are burning whatever they can burn because there's something out there for burning the things which are the smoke. So the solar problem is uh, uh, this is a part of the developed country, okay? And uh, this social responsibility, not only corporate, but also public level. And then, as you said, personal level is the issue, and we, I think our media has to play an important role of the individual responsibility on that. But in order to do that, they have to be trusted. And so Good question. <laughs> that I want to raise this issue to you, to some supporters. Uh, trusted. Uh, you know, Mongolia was before whatever bad thing is happening, then we are on international news. But recently, we have uh, all the time on international news because they're mining. So, uh, how do you take on that? I mean, is Mongolia going to be on media just because we have a lot of mineral wealth, or how do you take it? <laughs> um, quite frankly, yes, that's why you're on the media because of mineral wealth. <laughs> uh, that's the story right now, right. and that's how people are covering it. It's um, it it. It adds up to um, a lot of curiosity because it's an unmined mining place and a lot of people are looking in here wanting a piece of the action, you know, and that generates a tremendous amount of interest. Um, with that, though, also comes the culture and history that, and, and I actually don't think it's a bad thing for Mar Mongolia. I think the more people know about Mongolia, it could very well benefit Mongolia. Because if you ask most people what they know about Mongolia, um, exactly. they won't know anything. You have a local representative, representative in the country as a council director? I'm sorry, say that. Do you have a representative, a representation office in Mongolia? No. 
No, no we don't. We have uh, correspondents in Beijing who regularly come up here. Uh, okay. In fact, more and more. So. Oh, okay. So down the road, you will have your own office here. <laughs> maybe, maybe. It seems to me that you have a knife of your own, friends. <laughs> You know, the same question I have asked the guy who wrote the book. That in, in fact, our account, we have had him previously, his name is uh, Parakhana. And I have asked him, what the hell you called Mongolia like Mongolia? What is this? Why you are saying that China will take over the country in uh, 20 years? You know what he said? He said the same question. It's not so bad thing to be on the press. And not so bad thing that to take it over economically by bigger powers because there will be constant demand. So, with that remark, I just want to open the uh, podium to everybody. You have seen different opinions, interesting ideas, and very colorful presenters. Please go ahead, tell your name, and ask a question. Hi, it's uh, Mark Trell. Um, Brian, thanks for also uh, some marketing media. Um, one of the things that just occurs to me, so if you have 30 television channels and the bulk of them are politically based, um, surely you have the most boring uh, television in the world. <laughs> um, is that actually entertaining? Is there entertainment or is it just pretty much politicians saying please vote for me in four years' time? Mm -hmm. well, please. Okay, take the question. Okay. Um, to cover that point, we do not have any intellectual property we have intellectual property laws, but we do not have any uh, content that has a license in the country. So most of the TV stations based as a uh, brought over family to uh, they cover everything. However, they do not have a lot of entertaining programs on the TV station, which is because that is because we do not they do not have a fund to create a great program or. Admittedly, even our TV station do not have the educated people who can provide that kind of entertainment. So to solve that, I, I think, in my opinion, is that we need to work closely with intellectual property and closely with uh, bringing in uh, contents, licensed contents into the country so programs can improve and have a better quality. Thank you so much for uh, bringing to the major issue we want to reflect today, intellectual property rights. And with this, that's the entertainment. And, uh, you know, we used to have uh, all the Mexican serials once upon a time. I remember Richard Gere was once in Mongolia, and he agreed to the other guys, not in no, any press, nobody knows I'm here, etc. And he came to La Bata Hotel, there was a huge crowd. He saw about the angry and I told you, that what I, what I said, he said, the, the guy said, look, sorry Richard, this is not for you. This is for a Mexican couple who is a man. Heroes of the serial. So, so that's, uh, that's what it's about, the series and the intellectual rights. That's unfortunately happening. Nowadays, very fashionable thing is Korean movies. Oh, now every, our young people are dressed like Koreans, and even walk like Koreans. <laughs> A little bit because here in this country we have more you know, masculine, you know, horseman, this type, and this is disappearing. So, my point is, is again, intellectual property right. Please, uh, our public TV, tell us about this intellectual property right issue, problems you face. Well, actually, that Mexican serial was uh, um, actually uh, um, the intellectual property rights were first bought in Mongolia. That was the uh, legal product. After that, <laughs> so <laughs> after, <laughs> after that, things changed because at that time, uh, national TV was uh, still owned by state. So state could still because they were joined with intellectual property agreements and whatever. So, so um, um, to answer your question, I would like to say. Uh, little statistics to math. So um, we have uh, the survey. The survey so shows that total advertising capacity in Mongolia is about 10 million in, in the media. So um, we have, uh, you know, let's eliminate all the press and new media and websites. 
just just divide that into 30 television stations. So um, my math shows like 800. So if you take this 10 million, divide into 12 months, it's uh, 830 something million. And if you divide it into 30 channels, it's going to be like 27 thousand dollars a month per TV station. So that's the, the advertising revenue per TV station. So let's uh, say like um, you have 50 employees in each uh, station and they have 40, 400 two weeks per uh, salary in each. So that, that adds up like uh, $20,000. So all revenue uh, from uh, advertising <coughs> goes salary. And you have no fund for operation, no fund for uh, buy any intellectual property rights, and no fund for uh, equipment and um, uh, investment. So that really shows there's some you said hidden fund. Ten million dollars, million dollars a year. Ten million dollars. Yes. Ten million dollars advertising, yes. million 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 advertising million. revenue capacity yes. in the market, yes. and you very eloquently divided that into such a way that wow, our journalists are paid so low, and that's one of the reasons why we have a lot. TV's problem because they cannot afford buying journalists that run very tight highly. Could be. That's yeah. really they get sold <laughs> um, the shows and the business people. Um, um, I just want to uh, ask questions with the media panelists from um, YGL representatives. Um, my <clears throat> I'm thinking that we are uh, in, in old uh, times the media uh, media itself is tool, I think, and it combined with the content together as media. You know, TV stations uh, produce journalism, that's all together, same as media and television, and press is also. But now it's like uh, we have different tools like new media, website, etc., mobile phones. So we have just one content divided into a lot of um, tools. But I think now because of this PR campaign, like um, PR budget in government, both government and companies and corporate companies always increase. So like, let's say Apple companies, PR budget has always increased and Pepsi is coming, they, they have their uh, Come, uh, PR budget. So now content is also divided into journalism and PR. So we, we, we're not really talking about this. We just talk about media, 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 and journalists pay, pay, pay. But we can't say we, we don't want that money because that companies have their own marketing department and they have budget and they have to spend that by using these tools, by using us. So how are you going to divide? I think we have to, uh, it's time to talk about uh, uh, divide this content. We are only, uh, it's all, I have so one umbrella, it's like... Who will on this uh, difficult question? I think part of the problem is is that there's not a lot of transparency. Even though you might say that there's freedom of press, there's actually not transparency. I mean, I was told you don't even know who's behind buying some of the, who owns the stations, right? And so that automatically causes suspicion and that there's an agenda. So that, to me, would be the first thing that should be fixed, and I think once that is fixed, then you're going to find a lot of these TV stations probably disappear or consolidate because obviously people are using media outlets as a place in order to get information out. 
and if you can't, if you don't even know who's owning you and what their agenda, obviously they have an agenda, right? So I would think that's the common first layer that I would try to tackle. But in terms of, I mean, there's a very clear line where I work with what's appropriate and what's not. Copying, you know, is not appropriate, um, and. All of these things have very heavy punishments. Like you lose your job, right? If that infrastructure is not in, then it's much easier for the lines to get blurred. So an advertisement might become news. But where I work, it's very clear cut. And if we cross the line, we know that we will lose our jobs. It's not even negotiable, you know. But I mean, we struggle with, and not at Thompson Reuters, but I've struggled with self censorship, those type of things. But the fundamental. If, if the lines are not drawn, it's a very hard, hard problem to tackle. So I think perhaps maybe the press might want to put pressure to, to, to have the business side be more transparent about who they are. Otherwise, it, it's a political agenda or a... Or a I think so. I think it has to be legislated. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say you have freedom of press, but... It's another thing to have the laws that will support that. And, and I think as an individual media company, you can't expect to implement the laws. You can only do what's best behind you. But if you have somebody who controls you, who pays for you, who pays your staff, and they're, they have an agenda, it's a very difficult thing to do. Wow, you raised the most important and missing issue in this country, media. It is not only the media. In many things, in the public governance itself, because we have a conflict of interest very widely uh, in the governance and so So this is a, a very important issue we have asked and thank you for answering it that way. If there is anybody who is from the audience to add to this issue, please or ask a question, please. I, I agree that, that there needs to be sort of a, a legal framework, but I think that a sort of underlying pressure that will will ensure some sort of uh, adherence to a social license uh, for, for for the mainstream media is is really the new media, and and that will be what will pressure the mainstream media in many ways. And, and we see that in China with a much more controlled mainstream media needing to catch up with social media. And the most recent example would be the train crash in China. And you know, the, the, the mainstream media initial response was sort of what we would all expect in typical. The social media response was <coughs> reflective of what society felt about it. And then you watched a pretty powerful thing happen, which was that the mainstream media had to catch up. And you had CCTV correspondents doing some pretty powerful social commentary on air, uh, breaking into tears. I mean, you had the mainstream media catching up with social media. And so that's, that's going to be hopefully the pressure. Okay. Can, can, can I, uh, well, uh, at least uh, we know now that Nomen is the owner of Mongol TV, and that's uh, <laughs> uh, a, a, a bit of good news. Uh, uh, sorry? Sorry? The point is, Mami is owner of the TV that you know and me know. I know. But no, how I know it is if we have announced it. That's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So, uh, no, uh, our company is publicly announced its own products of company, never has said that it's owned by anybody else, and we presented that straight away, so it is known to the yeah. public. Well, yeah, uh, well, that's not the point. I just wanted to uh, reiterate the non fact. But uh, um, I, I come from a business background, and um, of course, there, there needs to be a certain balance. Uh, uh, and, and I entered politics, and uh, of course, uh, I think you meant uh, me, including uh, when you said, you know, we cannot differentiate the business group interests and the political interests. But uh, uh, I, I think it's a, 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 a learning curve for all of us. But uh, uh, I think uh, the, the uh, defining clear rules uh, uh, and showing leadership, like Nomin did with her company and I'm trying to do with what I'm doing right now is, uh, 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 and being open about it to the public will help the problem. 
I also agree that there needs to be uh, legislation to protect the public uh, uh, from uh, the, the evil. And now I want to ask a question from the panel on the uh, uh, labeling that uh, happens in the press. You know? So actually, press goes against somebody because some other business group or political group pays to uh, def def defamate uh, a, a particular company or a, or a poor person. I think, what is your take on this? How do we handle the issue? May I elaborate on uh, Pam's point? Um, what, what we have as a media in the country is that um, media obviously heard that we are financially not independent. The financially not independent being that makes us being dependent on somebody makes the journalist dependent on something. So the journalists are not independent to write anything in a certain point of view. We have something called protection uh, agreement with big companies and big corporations and government agencies, which is to protect against negative press towards that person. So that is limiting the journalists' right to write there freely and journalists to pre have a right, uh, free speech. However, on the other hand, the journalist has a quite uh, uh, freedom of uh, actually writing something negative about people. For example, if they find something uh, negative about gun, they're willing to write about it if someone else pays to do so. So what Gun is trying to ask from, I guess, OIGEL is that how do we tackle this issue? To tackle the, at some, at some point we're independent, but on the other hand we're not independent as a journalist. So how do we tackle this issue? <laughs> Just to continue, there are a couple of cases when somebody was uh, libeled in the press and then it led to some tragic consequences. And then uh, uh, the, the, uh, when the court starts the proceedings on the journalist, the, uh, the, it's hard to, uh, to find a balance when, is the, uh, uh, when, when the government or the, the judicial system is stepping on the rights of the journalist, and when is, uh, is it the point where, uh, uh, is there a line to uh, actually stop uh, uh, the that uh, freedom of press almost you know, where it does it stop? I don't think any journalist should be paid to write about with an agenda, right? You're you're hired to cover, and um, and it's your job to really give um, and show both sides of the story. And I, so, if someone said to me, unless I'm Unless I'm an advertiser or I'm doing something for, you know, but if somebody said to me, I want you to profile God, I would have to probably look at your good traits and your bad traits and talk to people who like you and don't like you, even if that, you know, it, it's, it, the lines are too blurred here. There's not enough, um, and, and also the process. Well, I think you create, you, you create laws that protect journalists to do their job. And until you have that, it's not gonna happen. And then the second thing you need to do is, like I, I mean, you, you've gotta free up the agenda, people, the people who have agendas from owning your media. Um, and, Cause I, if, if there's no law to protect the journalists, then this will be a vicious cycle. So I think what you need to do is go back to the government and say, you know, we need laws to protect us so that we can cover. I mean, you had an incident here not too long ago on July 1st, if I, is that the, the date, the July 1st incident where journalists were unfairly thrown in jail, is that right, for covering um, an incident? And, and, you know, really there should be laws in place to protect those people. It's, it, it, if there's not, then you're not going to have freedom. Yeah, you are referring to the event you said July 1st is a very uh, and a good day for the country political system. Uh, three years ago on July 1st there were people demonstrating against the 
uh, falsification of uh, election amount or voting account. And five persons were dead, shot by police, we believe. And uh, there is now clear evidence who shot up to now. Very strange. And, uh, but the palace of one party, which was burned that day, somehow removed with uh, majority of public money. And that's what the crazy thing is happening in this country. Is we don't like it. The media is reflecting about that. And the ruling party is taking the tax money and making like these buildings. Uh, uh, there are several journalists who are taken into prison in that of the background. And some of them have uh, proved that they were writing wrong things. Some were they were writing right, right things. So there's so many issues unregulated here still, we believe. And the very you said very good that uh, independence doesn't mean uh, transparent. That's the situation of journalism today, I believe. And uh, one of the reasons also journalists have very long. That's another, I think, a big uh, challenge for people who are writing and who wants to be independent. Okay, any other comment? We have another seven minutes to go ahead. And of course, this is the issue that we cannot tackle within uh, one hour altogether. But we have raised fantastic two points today. And I think it will be an important point. We have a journalist a lot of young people coming to this journalism world. I think it's very interesting to uh, take. Please. Uh, I said hello, and uh, actually I have a question, a comment about anything uh, from Ms. Hello. Ms. Pellet, I think, yeah, is that right? Uh, actually, you mentioned about transition, is that right? And uh, if possible, I want you to relate a little bit to explain more. Sure, when I talked about the transition in, yes. in the media world. Yeah, uh, uh, explain more please about transition and also the relation of uh, transition and media. Okay, sure. Yes. I mean, I'll make one comment just on the discussion that was happening just, just prior to this, which is that um, I don't think that Mongolia should feel as though it's somehow alone in terms of journalists not having proper rights. I mean, this is something that many different countries are grappling with, many countries that haven't, you know, relatively recently emerged from, you know, a dictatorship, essentially. So I, I think that um, there are, again, there are lessons to be learned. There are organisations like the Committee to Protect the Journalists that I'm sure would be more than happy to come and kind of give some advice on how to protect reporters appropriately. And I, I guess I, I just don't, it, it's not, um, the bifurcation isn't sort of east-west. It's, it's much more complicated, I would say, than that. Um, I think what I touched on earlier that, that you referred to was, or, or is a transition that, that I've certainly seen in the time that I've been working from um, a point where you could issue a press release and reporters would call and they'd call different sources and maybe they'd call your competitors or they'd um, and the idea of, um, of verifying news is also increasingly challenging because if you do a Google search, which you know is the first thing that most people do on things, um, the, the, the most frequently viewed item is not necessarily correct, right? But it's what people now start to think of as the truth. And I think that that's getting increasingly hard to find. So I'm not sure whether I've actually complicated things by saying that or not. But, um, but it is something I think about a lot because I'm obviously in a position where I'm trying to represent a company's point of view, understanding that there will be increasingly more questions about that. And, you know, I'd love to think that every single Hilton hotel room was immaculate, but, you know, we have guests who come into hotel rooms and take pictures and post them online that would tell you otherwise. So, you know, <laughs> you, you definitely have your feet held to the fire. You have been dealing with uh, certain applications in your company where this all the media and social media in particular used for you know, more educated information, knowledge transfer. Could you tell that part of the uh, role of media? For mobile applications? Yeah, mobile applications of knowledge transfer. Oh, yeah, well, actually, this is something we were having this discussion yesterday. Uh, some fellow YGLs and I have been working on uh, building a technology platform to, in, uh, to enable the creation, uh, the uh, submission, and the distribution of mobile applications to, uh, to emerging markets, to specifically to disadvantaged youth. 
to help uh, give them education tools and, and opportunity for uh, sort of basic work skills and helping build small businesses. And I, it's just been astounding to me. I, I, having spent most of my time in you know, very much the cutting edge of mobile technology space, um, primarily in the United States, uh, I, I've just been overwhelmed to, to discover, or first of all, my ignorance on, on the complexities of, of distributing mobile applications in so many countries, but the penetration, I mean, a, a study um, that we've been sharing from the Bharti Foundation in India, most rural families you know, have at least one cell phone. You have 3.8 billion people in uh, emerging markets that have cellular phones, and, and you're going to be having five billion people uh, projected in the next two years with at least one smartphone globally. So if, I think it's a tremendous opportunity to, to think of, and for the Mongolians and for the young people um, here to look at you know, what tools can you uh, give to your community, not only in Lombatar, but outside, and that can, can help uh, people grow and realize their full potential, and, and what kind of um, uh, just a little story for, for a real uh, sort of put this in perspective. I was mentioning earlier today, we, we recently got video out of Yemen uh, from some young women that are using cell phones to help build small businesses. And this one woman, she started a small Ethiopian baking uh, business, but uh, she, the, the grocery store doesn't open at a convenient, uh, at any kind of predictable timeline. And so she could, was never allowed to leave her house to go out and sell the bread unless she knew that the store was open uh, from her father with the permission. So now she has a text messaging system from the grocery store that actually sends her a text message when the grocery store is open, so she's allowed to go and sell her bread. Something very, very simple that was just kind of such a, uh, so just to highlight the opportunity of very simple tools that are not expensive and that can really give opportunity. Well, thank you, Michael. See, now as a, you said priest, but, uh, Main, the stream media being controlled by uh, social stream media. That's something, the factor which is coming to the country. I know the type of communication message, Yahoo, LinkedIn, all these are very popular among the Mongolians. And I think in the way they will control, uh, they will, uh, like in China, push the main media stream working in the manner that they are accepting. And I think with this, uh, uh, well, you know, any more questions from audience? Okay, if, uh, if, if, okay, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, I'd like to make one last um, statement. Um, yes, I, I do agree with all of the YGLs and uh, the discussion panel about all the points that have been made, um, especially with yours, I was saying that uh, mainstream media needs to start, it needs to catch up with social media. Um, because uh, uh, I recently read a small joke saying that um, uh, it takes about 30 seconds for an earthquake New York to reach DC, and um, uh, it said that Twitter is faster than an earthquake because as soon as an earthquake hit, uh, hits um, New York, someone tweets about it within five seconds. Someone uh, receives it within ten seconds. So how that's in you know in a way, Twitter can be faster than an earthquake. So you, you're that you can have enough twenty seconds to run out of the building. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, one another important. Um, uh, the point is that is uh, is this about uh, citizens, citizenship journalism that I'd like to make um, because the internet becomes sort of like a, an open platform for any individual, uh, just like just uh, for ordinary people like myself to go online, um, write maybe a blog post about uh, certain things that are either happening in the country or within your daily life, um, so that other people can also come read about it, um, uh, write their own comments, their own thoughts. And so it becomes like a, a totally, completely new platform for individuals um, disregarding your rank. And um, uh, one example um, I'd like to also make is that just recently, about um, a few months ago, uh, it, it started off as a, a Facebook group called UB Council. So uh, just recently, uh, the UB Council, um, UB, uh, which is written Y O U and then B E. Um, but it's actually a stand stands for Ulaanbaatar. So the, uh, the city council, uh, the Ulaanbaatar city council, was established just recently, which started off as a Facebook group, uh, which added, uh, which um, invited people, uh, all different ages, uh, for people to come into this group, write about what's uh, what they think uh, needs to be 
uh, fix or what problems they, uh, they think had, uh, has been happening in the city, what, like, what people could possibly do to make uh, the city better, to uh, solve these problems. So, um, yeah, this is... Uh, Very much, this is fantastic news. Is. We have now online UV Council. That's fantastic. It would be way better than our real UV Council. <laughs> 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 because probably it will not speak their land. We will be probably can we uh, elect that uh, mayor of this uh, online UV council <laughs> by citizens? Because you know, Ulaanbaatar is one of the few cities where we don't elect our mayor. Our mayor is nominated by the uh, uh, prime minister. That's why he is probably responsible for the prime minister, not for us. So that's why we have such a traffic we have, and uh, you know all these problems you guys face and see these days, so along with other positive sides. So finally, this is a democratic country, and we try our best to do our best for everybody to live better. And with this, a lot of mineral wealth, I hope every Mongolian will live better, not only you. And that's what we do today. It's an important step towards that main purpose. And every word said here would be contributed to this movement. And you, the YLG delegation here, yourself, is a part of it. And everybody coming here also, uh, you are contributing to that. Nothing to say about my panel. Everybody has a wonderful contribution. Thank you very much. And uh, this sort of things is happening in this country, you know. And this is an initial form of foreign affairs. And you were not supposed many years ago to say these words were said today. You could go to another place. That was that time media was not free as today. So at least we have this media free. And we need something that uh, not only free, it should be transparent and funded properly with copyright law properly observed. So this is the takes, I think, from our uh, very interesting discussions. I think you, everybody here who is in this audience, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'd like to thank uh, um, uh, Professor Daryl Sahel uh, for being the moderator on this discussion panel. Uh, you are the Larry King of Mongolia, I mean, I'm sure. And I love watching this So thank you very much.